you were uh, working in ALS ambulance and you were called to a multi-story apartment building for a male party who is complaining of palpitations and anxiety. So you pull up uh, to the street, you park in front of the triple decker, right? Pretty normal call for most of us, pretty common complaint. Um, fortunately, 99% of the time, it's really just anxiety. Uh, but you always need to keep an eye out for real problems, right? A lot of cardiac issues can present with palpitations, and so can a lot of different tox issues, etc. Um, I think it's important to also keep in mind that anxiety is often a symptom of serious illness, not just a complaint onto itself. Um, so always kind of something to think about and keep in the back of your head. Anyway, uh, you arrive on scene and you find this 61-year-old guy sitting on his couch. He's alert and oriented, all of that. Uh, but he's got this bounding rapid pulses. Um, however, he just kind of looks like crap. He's diaphoretic, anxious, that sort of thing. Um, his physical exams, otherwise okay. Um, he denies any shortness of breath, denies chest pain. Um, really, he's just complaining of palpitations and anxiety. He kind of notes that it feels like his heart is racing. And that's kind of how he describes his palpitations to you. So he does have a history of coronary artery disease. Uh, he has prior MI with a couple stents. Um, you know, uh, he has a, you know, the standard kind of chest painy type patient um, or like cardiac -y patient, um, you know, diabetes, hypertension, that sort of thing. Um, so basically he has a history of heart disease, um, which is, you know, he probably has some lasting effects from that. So that CAD and that prior MI part can be important. Um, you know, he has a structural heart issue, um, you know, or you know does he have a structural heart issue we don't we don't really know so your partner gets some vitals for you uh and hopefully you all recognize this rhythm pretty quickly and it brings us to our first question uh what rhythm do you see on the monitor so if we come back and look here uh we have a heart rate of 160s um you know it's raining between 160 and 170 uh, his SPO2 is okay, his entitles is okay, um, he's breathing relatively okay, and his blood pressure is pretty good. But that rhythm's concerning, right? And hopefully I'll recognize that one pretty quick. Um, he's in VTAC, right? And more specifically, he's in a sustained monomorphic VTAC. Um, so let's talk about VTAC. Uh, so before we talk about VTAC, uh, we'll talk kind of just ventricular arrhythmias in general, because VTAC is a form of a ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, and basically, it's a group of tachyarrhythmias that originate from the ventricles. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, these usually occur with um, patient or you occur in patients with uh, underlying structural heart disease, uh, and they're considered more dangerous than most other arrhythmias because they have a high potential to limit cardiac output. Right, your ventricles are the big organs that squeeze and it squeezes the blood out to the body, into the lungs, and etc. And if those aren't working appropriately, you're kind of screwed. The big uh, ventricular arrhythmias are VTAC, VFib, and actually just PVCs. Um, keep in mind we can differentiate between VTAC of like VTAC with a pulse and VTAC without a pulse. Um, this guy has obviously has a pulse. So we're talking more VTAC with a pulse, but VTAC without a pulse is cardiac arrest, as we know. So ventricular arrhythmias are usually caused by one of three mechanisms. We have abnormal automaticity, we have a triggered activity, and we have a reentry circuit. So abnormal automaticity is basically just misbehaving myocytes. It refers to the firing of electrical impulses by cardiac cells that normally don't demonstrate automaticity themselves. Um, so basically like a random myocyte acting inappropriately and creating a loop. In a triggered activity, um, you know, there's an impulse triggered inappropriately. The best example here is something called an early after depolarization or an R on T phenomenon. Um, you know, the, um, this is also the cause of torsade pseudal prolonged QT. And then finally, the reentry circuits, right? This is by far the most common of the three. Um, and this is where you have a propagation of an impulse around a circuit. Basically, there are two pathways for the electrical signal. This is what happens in ischemia and kind of scar-related ventricular tachycardia, um, which is the most common cause of sustained monomorphic VTAC. The most common cause of polymorphic VTAC is actually an active MI. Uh, but this is the most common cause of sustained monomorphic VTAC. It's almost always caused by some form of scarring in the ventricle, that like underlying structural heart disease. Um, you know, basically someone has an MI, they get myocardial scar formation, uh, and this can cause a reentry circuit. Um, if you look at the picture there, it kind of demonstrates how we're not going to get super into the path though, real quick. So I want to focus more on treatment. Uh, so this is actually what happens with the guy in our case, right? He has a history of recent MI, as it turns out, and despite some stents, right, he has some structural damage to his heart kind of remaining. So now that's out of the way, let's talk about VTAC more specifically, because that's what our case is actually about. In VTAC, we have a whole bunch of different classifications and definitions. 
VTAC itself refers to the rapid wide arrhythmia of ventricular origin. Generally, the heart rate's greater than 100, usually greater than 120, uh, and the, or uh, 160, and uh, the QRS is greater than 120 milliseconds. Uh, VTAC is generally regular in rate. It can be slightly irregular based on like different types of you know fusion or capture beats or something like that that comes with it, or some of your polymorphic VTACs might be a little irregular, but they're generally regular in rate and appearance. Um, you know, and but it can be slightly irregular. Um, and we'll go over capture beats in a second here. So VTAC is a ventricular problem, right? But it doesn't mean the SA node and the AV node uh, have stopped working. They're usually working fine. Uh, you just have a ventricular impulse that's propagating a signal. Every once in a while, regular impulses can get through the VTAC and propagate normally. And that's what a capture beat is. Uh, a normal SA node propagated signal kind of captured in a ventricular response, um, you know, that sort of thing. Fusion beats are when a ventricular impulse is discharged simultaneously with an atrial impulse. So basically the impulse enters the Hisperkinji system and, um, you know, the ventricles will be depolarized by both, um, you know, the ventricular circuit and the SA to AV node. And you'll get this kind of weird melding of the two, this weird kind of hybrid beat. Uh, and that hybrid beat is called a fusion beat. Uh, from there, we can break it down into non-sustained and sustained VTAC. Non-sustained VTAC is three or more consecutive PVCs at a rate of greater than 100 beats per minute. Uh, that spontaneously terminates within 30 seconds, um, basically without hemodynamic compromise. Uh, these are basically your kind of self-limiting runs of VTAC. And then you have your sustained VTAC, right? And this is VTAC for that lasts longer than 30 seconds and or is accompanied by a hemodynamic instability. From there, we can kind of break it down further into monomorphic and polymorphic VTAC. Monomorphic VTAC is usually what we think of when we think of VTAC. Each beat kind of looks the same, roughly, uh, same width, same amplitude, um, in the same lead. Each beat's kind of uniform. Uh, the impulse originates in one ventricle, uh, and it can be left or right, depends on which type of VTAC it is, and spreads, uh, you know, uh, to the muscle, cell to cell to cell, um, conduction kind of through both every time. Um, it's usually anywhere between 160 to 250 beats, uh, but 100 to 200. It depends on which textbook you really read. Polymorphic VTAC is uh, complexes that vary in amplitude and duration or width. Uh, and this is because there's multiple ventricular foci going on, uh, firing together, and it leads to kind of weird depolarizations. So it's coming from different spots. Now, uh, there's a subtype of polymorphic VTAC that you may already be familiar with, uh, and that's torsades de point, or torsades de point, or whatever you want to pronounce it, right? Um, basically, it's that characteristic twisting pattern that we hear, or like the band twisting, uh, and it's caused by a prolonged QT issues 99% of the time. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that torsades is a polymorphic VTAC, but not all polymorphic VTAC is torsades. It's just a, it's kind of a subtype of polymorphic VTAC. Uh, our patient is monomorphic VTAC, so we'll kind of focus in on there. Uh, but real quick, um, sustained monomorphic VTAC, like what this guy is in, uh, can look a lot like something called SVT with aberrancy. Um, this is usually like an SVT with like a left bundle or right bundle, something that already makes the uh, ECG look wide and kind of gross, but faster. Uh, so it can mimic VTAC, basically. Um, this isn't an ECG class. It's a kind of a more treatment-focused one. So we'll focus there. Um, but I'm telling you that this is, um, you know, I'm telling you this patient is about a morph VTAC, right? It's not a weird SVT or anything like that. But just know that there can kind of be a gray area there. Uh, and there's several ways to differentiate the two. Um, you can look things up like uh, Brogada criteria if you're interested in stuff like that. Um, quick version of Brogada criteria is here. Basically, you're looking if there's a uh, absent QRS complex in all precordial leads. Um, RS interval is greater than 100 uh, in any precordial lead. Uh, if there is AV dissociation or if there's a, you know, morphologic criteria, basically, basically, does it look like VTAC um, in both V1 and V6? Uh, basically, any one of those four things means it's VTAC. Uh, and then if there's none of the above, you can consider SVT with aberrancy. Brugado criteria is cool because, or the algorithm is cool um, because it's 99% sensitive and 96.5% specific for VT versus SVT. Um, so it's a great tool, uh, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this case. Uh, Master Medics has a whole bunch of other videos on ECGs and stuff like that, and you can check that out in the membership for like learn the differences and stuff. The important thing to remember here is when in doubt, it's ventricular tachycardia 100% of the time, right? Uh, every time it's VTAC, especially if the patient has a history of ischemia or other kind of underlying heart disease or structural abnormality. Turns out, if you treat it like VTAC, the patient will be fine. Uh, 
right? SVT, if you treat it like VTAC, the patient will be fine, right? A lot of the ventricular tachycardia drugs can help SVT also. If you treat VT like SVT, that can actually be bad, right? So when in doubt, if it grows wide, fast rhythm, it's VTAC until proven otherwise. Treat it as such. All right, anyway, moving on. When we talk about treating these patients, the big thing is determining stability. So you need to ask yourself the question, is the patient stable or unstable? And this happens to be our next question from the case as well. The jam with ventricular tachycardia is that cardiac output can be reduced dramatically. Uh, this is due to a decreased ventricular filling from a rapid rate and then a lack of um, properly timed or coordinated atrial contraction, right? So the ventricle is moving really, really fast. And you don't have that atria squeeze to get the blood properly into the ventricle to eject it out. So you, you get poor filling, basically. Uh, and that LB dysfunction kind of leads to a decreased stroke volume, which leads to hemodynamic intolerance or collapse. And then that also leads to ischemia. And then you get a decreased cardiac output, right? You get decreased myocardial perfusion. You get a worsening inotropic response. So the heart starts to kind of not be able to squeeze as well. And then you get a degeneration basically into VFib uh, and then well, death, right? Um, but basically in VTAC, the cardiac output can be dropped dramatically, uh, but not always. Uh, the presentation for VTAC is actually pretty variable. Uh, it can range from sudden cardiac death on one end to like basically an incidental finding on the other, uh, which has actually happened to me before. Um, we had a guy who was just, you know, uh, sitting out. It was super hot out. He was just kind of sitting by his picnic table. His whole family was there. Uh, he basically just got a little anxious and wanted to just get checked on. His kind of family made him, and we threw him on the monitor, and he was in VTAC. That was his only complaint, was just, ah, feel a little, like, a little anxious from uh, being outside and the heat and stuff and just being with family. Um, so it can actually just be an incidental thing. Um, really, it depends kind of on the clinical setting, the heart rate, and the presence of underlying disease. So basically, uh, or generally, heart rate's under 150, because um, you can be in VTAC at anything above 100. Um, under 150, under 160 can be surprisingly well tolerated in the short term, uh, even in like pretty compromised individuals. Like most people can tolerate that relatively well. Um, patients with a normal ventricular function can tolerate prolonged periods, um, usually in the range of like 150 to 200. It can kind of be variably tolerated. Uh, per the American Heart Association, uh, or the AJ, uh, if the patient is hypotensive, in acute mental status change, signs of shock, ischemia, chest discomfort, signs and symptoms of heart failure, uh, those patients are considered unstable. Uh, difficulty breathing and shortness of breath are usually kind of lumped into that definition as well, so also to keep that in mind. But per AHA, ACLS, et cetera, um, those things make you unstable. And those are pretty reasonable. It's a decent list of stuff. Now, in real life, there's probably a little more gray area there. Uh, that's true. Um, you know, Trust me, I love gray area conversations. But at the end of the day, um, this is what's taught in ACLS and ACLS in most textbooks. And you know, it's kind of the foundation that we need to accept before we start talking about gray areas. At the end of the day, Stable patients get treated with meds and close monitoring. Unstable patients get synchronized cardioversion. So let's look at our patient here. Uh, do you think he is stable or unstable? Honestly, he's a little pale, but otherwise his blood pressure is pretty good. His SpO2 is good. His end title is okay. He doesn't need, you know, he doesn't have any chest pain. He doesn't have shortness of breath. He doesn't have difficulty breathing. He's not complaining of weakness. There's been no syncope. There's no signs of heart failure. There's no altered mental status. He's got some palpitations. And feels like his heart's racing, which is honestly fair. I would argue this guy's stable for now. So we're going to call this stable monomorphic VTAC. So kind of question three from the initial case, uh, how do we go about treating the stable VTAC patient? First, follow your standard ABCs, right? Like you got to check all of those boxes, give O2 as needed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? This class is focusing on a VTAC patient. So we're going to talk more specifically about that just for the sake of time. When it comes to VTAC, the big things to deal with stable VTAC is discontinuation of any offending agent, because there's a lot of meds, right? A lot of cardiac meds specifically, and really kind of lots of other meds, uh, can cause arrhythmias. Uh, and any antiarrhythmic can actually be proarrhythmic as well in different dosing. So it's always something to keep in mind. Um, usually more of an issue in like a hospital setting, but, you know, think about it. Uh, most importantly, however, we're going to administer antiarrhythmics uh, in an attempt to chemically cardiovert the patient out of VTAC while always kind of keeping in mind that the patient can decompensate at any time. Uh, and just because they were stable, you know, three minutes ago, doesn't mean they will stay that way, 
So always reassessing these types of patients, uh, correcting any electrolyte issues, that kind of thing. Imbalances of most electrolytes can do funky, weird things to the heart. And then consider any underlying causes and kind of treat them as needed, right? Especially with your polymorphic or even this guy, right? Um, he could be having a STEMI at the end of this, right? It's just masked by the ventricular tachycardia. So there's always that other additional thing. Like, why are they in VTAC, right? VTAC doesn't just spontaneously happen generally. Um, the big thing for us to focus on and kind of what I want to talk about moving forward is the antiarrhythmic meds. So let's talk about kind of our options for drugs. Just kind of a quick disclaimer there. I'm American. Uh, I'm used to the AHA and the kind of their way of doing things and ACLS drugs and doses. Uh, but I recognize that here at Mastery Medics, we have a kind of multinational audience. So uh, I'm going to kind of keep this all of this generalized. Uh, for my fellow Americans, this means that it may differ from ACLS recommendations in certain places and certain meds uh, and kind of dosing and recommendations. So the things I say may or may not be the official AHA ACLS recommendations. Um, you know, when in doubt, follow your local protocols, of course, and your country's governing body, um, you know, the AHA for the United States. But I'm just going to kind of generally talk. So with that out of the way, let's go over the three kind of antiarrhythmics. They're the main three. There's other options and there's other drugs that are used. These are the main three drugs for ventricular tachycardia. We have amiodarone, lidocaine, and brocanamide. So amiodarone first, uh, it's a class three antiarrhythmic, which means it's primarily a potassium channel blocker. So basically it blocks potassium, leaving the cell in phase three of the action potential, uh, which kind of leads to a decreased duration of depolarization uh, and thus an increase in the refractory period. That's kind of how it works. It does some other things too, but eh, it does a bunch of things. Uh, amio is kind of a dirty drug. It acts on like several different receptors, um, but it's effective kind of at everything. The jam is that once you give it, uh, it's there for days, not hours. Uh, Amio is really long lasting. It has a really long half-life. So it's one of those drugs that you give it and you can't take it back. Um, it's also the cause, it can also cause hypotension. So it needs to be given slowly, usually over 10 minutes. Um, technically, fun fact, the drug itself doesn't cause hypotension. The solution it sits in does. Uh, but still, it can cause hypotension. Whoops. All right, uh, lidocaine's next. Um, this one is kind of making a comeback, at least in the eyes of the HA, as of like 2020-ish update, I believe it was. Uh, it's considered equivalent to Amio for that purpose. Um, you know, the old school medics loved it already and will, you know, told you, I bet, because they absolutely loved it. Um, they told you it was better than Amio the whole time. Turns out the AA, or the AHA at least, um, is starting to kind of go back towards it or at least consider it equivalent. Uh, so lidocaine is a class uh, 1B uh, antiarrhythmic, so it's a basically a weak sodium channel blocker. Uh, technically, there's multiple classes of sodium channel blockers that all work slightly differently, but at the end of the day, um, they all ultimately just slow conduction velocity down. Um, Lido is used, uh, or used to be a drug kind of of choice, and it worked well for years until Amio hit the market, and to be honest, there was a lot of uh, politics and money thrown around kind of involved that whole thing from the start, so it's good to see it make a comeback. And then finally, um, kind of an older drug made new again, uh, procanamide. Um, this is also a sodium channel blocker, but it's a class 1A instead of a class 1B like lidocaine. Uh, procanamide used to be popular and then kind of fell out of favor. Uh, it's kind of a long story, uh, but it's back and it's arguably the best choice in a lot of ways. So let's kind of get into that real quick. Uh, let's say you had equal drugs. Uh, you can carry and freely use all three of these drugs. Um, which one do you pick? It's actually not a very straightforward answer, uh, though I bet a lot of you have some very strong opinions anyway. Uh, I know I used to and still kind of do. Uh, there are, you know, 50 million arguments for or against each one and different systems um, have different options. Uh, so I'm, again, just going to kind of talk generally. Amio is probably the most commonly used out of the three, and it's, you know, it's super easy to dose. It's hard to mess up, honestly. Uh, it's a great choice for resistant ventricular tachycardia and kind of um, depending on what you study or what study you read, um, it's often thought of as the most effective drug. Uh, around 60% of patients in a ventricular storm, uh, so you know, persistent ventricular tachycardia, will convert with amio ultimately. Um, the jam, as I said, is it's you know kind of on board for the long haul. It's slower acting and it can cause hypotension. So there's some issues with it. Um, there's usually an uh, infusion component to it as well after the initial bolus, which can kind of be annoying. Um, 
you know, it can also cause a QT prolongation, uh, which would be a jam in a patient who already has a prolonged QT. Uh, but, you know, that whole premise is kind of controversial and it may or may not be as big of a deal as your previous thought. Who knows? Uh, the usual dosing for ventricular tachycardia for uh, someone who's alive, right? Someone with a pulse is 150 milligram infusion over 10 minutes. So usually what you do is you take 150 milligrams, you put it in a 10 or a 100 ml bag with a 10 drop set and it should go in over roughly 10 minutes, plus or minus a few minutes. Um, and then usually what happens with the MEO um, and this, some places will do it, some places won't. Uh, it's probably the most common infusion I've seen after a bolus, um, but it'll be a milligram a minute for the first six hours, and then you'll drop it down to half a milligram a minute for the next 18 hours. So it, um, they, they stay on it for a while. Lidocaine uh, is more of a pain to dose, right? Because you actually have to do just a little bit of math. It's not that straight 150 dose. Um, but it's relatively easy, uh, and it's usually considered an equal kind of contender to AMEO. Uh, the nice thing with lidocaine is that it can be given IV push, so it's fast acting, and it can be redosed um, kind of easily in breakout arrhythmia, so you can keep redosing it. Um, it also isn't associated with hypotension. So both AMEO and procanamide are associated with hypotension when given, whereas lidocaine generally isn't. Um, NIDO is usually more effective in ventricular tachycardia associated with acute ischemia. Um, you know, like during an active MI, right? Um, but it's been, you know, called into question in the past, um, and it's like not ischemic VTAC, and it's actually kind of a weaker drug in general. I don't know. It's probably considered equivalent to AMEO. Pick one. Uh, the dosing is one to one and a half milligrams per kilogram, usually, uh, and then it can be repeated at a lower dose uh, every five to ten minutes, kind of as needed, which is cool. Uh, and you can also do an infusion of AMEO. That's the whole like lidocaine clock, or uh, I'm sorry, lidocaine. Um, that's the whole like lidocaine clock thing that you had to learn in school, just like a dopamine clock. Same concept. Uh, so procanamide is actually my personal favorite. Uh, I've used it several times now. Uh, the Procamio trial um, had some interesting results when comparing procanamide to AMEO. Uh, and some societies now recommend it as the first line drug. Um, essentially, ventricular tachycardia terminated um, within 40 minutes in 67%, I believe. Uh, of patients with procanamide versus only like, I think it was 35 to 40, 38, 38% of patients with AMEO. Um, so 67% versus 38%, uh, you know, procanamide versus AMEO. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, probably procanamide versus AMEO is probably better. Uh, so what about procanamide versus lidocaine? Um, a different study uh, looked at that too. Uh, so uh, procanamide terminated over 50% of episodes of stable monomorphic VTAC, just like this guy's in, uh, while lidocaine only terminated around 10 to 20%. So it probably beats both of them. Uh, for me, it's my go-to, but I, you know, not everyone has it, right? You definitely need a pump to give it. Uh, and a lot of EMS services don't carry it, at least in the U.S. Um, I only carry it, like, uh, I work with both a 911 job and a flight job. Uh, my flight job, we've had access to procanamide, whereas, like, my ground job doesn't. So uh, it's one of those things that just you may not have it. Um, but what else is cool about it is especially in hemodynamically stable patients, procanamide is um, good at not just terminating the arrhythmia, but it can also slow it down uh, and it can work pretty fast. So again, right, some patients, especially if the heart rate's under 150s, 160s, they can usually tolerate the attack pretty well. So even if it doesn't convert the rhythm, it usually slows it down enough to make the patient more stable. So it kind of gives you that buffer, which is kind of neat. The other two drugs don't do that. Uh, the usual dosing is kind of a pain. Uh, it's 20 to 50 milligrams a minute. Um, basically, you keep going up uh, until it stops. And the only reason it's a pain is because you need a pump to do it. Um, and then you can only go to a max of 15 to 17 mg per gig. So usually what I do is calculate that ahead of time. Um, so I know when I my, reach my threshold. And then I'll go uh, 20, 30, 40, 50. And just kind of keep increasing the dose as I go, like every 5 to 10 minutes or so until it stops. There's a bunch of ways to dose procanamide. Uh, follow your local, you know, guidelines. Uh, so honestly, there's no, you know, consensus on what one to pick, right? It's really about following what your local area does. Um, AJ considers uh, amio and lidocaine to be the same. Procanamide may be better than both. They don't really know. Uh, it's kind of a toss up. All three at the end of the day will probably work, or you know, may not work. And you're going to need multiple agents because that's another thing that can happen in the hospital. Usually not in EMS is, you know, 
Patients can be on both Amio and Lidocaine, or they can be on all three at different times to see what works. And, you know, there's more kind of ability to play around with that. So let's say you gave one of the drugs um, and it worked. Now what? Well, first I would reassess everything, right? Uh, but then I would do a 12 lead and see if there's an acute ischemia kind of underlying that ventricular tachycardia uh, that we may have missed due to the VTAC. Uh, some places will recommend adding an infusion of whatever drug you just used. Uh, generally, you don't have to do that. Uh, you don't actually need to do that, um, assuming the VTAC terminates. Um, the drug can actually be discontinued. However, uh, if a patient has a reoccurring episode, um, you can usually redose it, or you can keep them on an infusion. So that's usually kind of the recommendation there. Uh, but again, follow your local stuff. So let's say our patient decompensated, right? You gave whatever drug, um, and they, you know, they decompensate. Right? They have chest pain, shortness of breath, they're hypotensive, maybe they're a little altered, whatever. Now they need synchronized cardioversion, right? Um, you're going to do that at your manufacturer's recommendations. Um, Zoll versus Lifepack versus Philip actually have different recommendations on what settings to use initially and continuously. Um, so just follow whatever one your monitor uses. Um, I know like Zoll only goes to 200, whereas Lifepack will go to 350, and this use whatever your monitor says, uh, which is actually the official recommendation of the AHA also is to use manufacturer uh, recommendations. So um, now you shock, it works. That was quick, right? Um, because you were prepared for it. That's such a big takeaway. Always be ready for decompensation in these patients. Assume they will decompensate every time. These are patients that I pull the pads, I put the pads on them, I have, I'm monitoring the pads, right? Um, you know, whether they're getting meds or not, right? Always put the pads on, always be ready for it. So, uh, to kind of wrap up this case, uh, you made it to the hospital, and there you had some kind of reoccurring arrhythmia, uh, and the patient was ended up being started on an amiodarone drip and a beta blocker. Um, the only med that's actually proven to reduce long-term mortality and disease and ventricular attack currents, um, VTAC reoccurrence is actually a beta blocker. That's why all these patients will be on some form of beta blocker afterwards. Um, and they may or may not be on an antiarrhythmic. Sometimes they'll keep amio for a while orally, uh, but they'll, they'll be on a beta blocker usually for the rest of their lives. Uh, and that night, he got a brand new uh, internal cardiac um, defibrillator, oh, ICD, um, which is generally kind of the overall recommended treatment, especially if they uh, have a reoccurring arrhythmia, is to get one of those placed. Uh, and this guy just the next day. He does really well. Uh, he's discharged a couple days later. Um, had some med adjustments uh, in his new defibrillator, and at three-month follow-up, he was doing well at home. Uh, this was a real case. So good, good outcome on this one. Uh, and that's it for today's case. I hope you can take something away from it. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Uh, I'm not uh, able to do the live case, but I'll, you know, I'll still check Facebook and check the comments and stuff, and I'll answer within the next day or two. Uh, so until next time, thanks for watching.